Well, it looks like it is 12 o'clock on this Monday, September 19th. So we'll go ahead and kick off today's Lunch and Learn uh, lecture series. Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, welcome to the Georgia Tech Manufacturing Institute Fall 2022 Lunch and Learn Lecture Series. This is our second lecture of the fall semester. Lectures are held each uh, Monday, fall and spring, except on holidays, and they're uh, held at noon each week. My name is Paige Shee, and I serve as the Strategic Partners Officer for GTMI. GTMI hosts this lecture series, as I said, each fall and spring semester, as a uh, fall and spring, as an avenue to share and exchange manufacturing knowledge within our global community of researchers, students, industry, and government partners. Um, this semester, lectures are being offered via a mix of live, hybrid, and online formats. Today's lecture is entirely online. GTMI is part of the larger Georgia Tech research enterprise that includes 10 interdisciplinary research institutes. Uh, GTMI's focus is on manufacturing research, development, and deployment designed to address the grand challenges of today's manufacturers and we help our partner organizations, both internal and external, move innovations from the lab to the marketplace. GTMI has a wide array of facilities and equipment located both on main campus for basic research and in the advanced manufacturing pilot facility for applied research. Our mission includes education and workforce training, collaborative uh, partnerships with industry, academia and government, as well as thought leadership. Today's session is intended to be interactive. So at the conclusion of the speaker's presentation, uh, roughly the last 15 minutes, we will open up the floor for Q&A. And we invite uh, all the audience members at that time to go ahead and type into the chat any questions they may have for the speaker. Um, and you will be able to unmute yourself at that time if you wanna submit, a, you know, ask a follow-up question for today's speaker. And now I'm pleased to present Jason Roth, Engineering Education Program Manager at Autodesk, who will discuss Autodesk Fusion 360 Generative Design. Jason has been in education for over 15 years. He has served as a middle school and high school technology education teacher, high school manufacturing and engineering teacher, and a chair and assistant dean for engineering and technology at Ivy Tech Community College. Prior to teaching, Jason worked in the racing and aerospace industries, Currently, Jason serves as a program manager for Autodesk Education and collaborates with colleges and universities throughout North America. Jason also has coached football at the high school and college level for 22 years. Um, it's my pleasure to welcome you, uh, Jason. I'll turn the mic over to you. Appreciate it. Thank you very much. Uh, excited to be here. I see uh, people are rolling in, uh, which is great. Let me move everything across here. Well, uh, I'm very excited to to present uh, to the group today. Looking forward to um, to the conversations uh, as well. So, uh, we're going to talk about Fusion 360. We're going to talk about uh, generative design, kind of an overview. I'm going to actually jump into the software. Uh, we're going to make it uh, sing and dance, and um, talk about some of the things that are leading up to you know where generative design is going. Some of the things we have in place that kind of are allowing generative design to be more effective. Uh, and um, I really wanna hear questions from you all too. What, you know, what, what, uh, what excites you? What, uh, what interest level do you have? Where do you see this being used? So um, please don't hesitate to put those in the chat. So uh, Fusion 360, all right? So I, I know that uh, we, we have been working uh, at Georgia Tech uh, with several instructors, uh, especially in the biomechanical engineering and mechanical engineering. Uh, degrees and several of the maker spaces in utilizing Fusion 360. And we have a, a few areas that are starting to use generative design. So understanding this new technology, what it is, where it can lead you and how it can help you, not only in your time at Georgia Tech and in your engineering programs or design programs, but also in your future as you go into the workforce and start creating new and exciting things. So kind of what are some of the challenges today that we see? Well, one of the challenges that we see is this, this uh, balance between performance and cost. So we know that uh, we've got to be uh, more efficient. We've got to get things done faster and on time, of course. And we also got to be conscious of our costs. So how do we balance that and how do we effectively change that? Well, one of the ways normally is we work faster, right? We hire more people, we do more, but do we really have to do that? Also, uh, we also have that time of being able to actually uh, innovate. I know a lot of you probably have worked on many student teams, 
<clears throat> and you get maybe a couple of three or four iterations and then you have to go on because your time is cut short. So how do we allow you to have more time to innovate, more time to think critically and more time to evaluate options uh, as part of your design? And then the last thing is, is this expertise level. You know, we all like to think we want it, we, we know everything, but in actuality, we are very good at, at certain things and we may not be very good in other things, or we just may know a little bit on the surface, but not enough in detail. So how do we get that experience? How do we use those experiences? And how do we gather that experience in order to make things in unique and different ways? So what is generative design? Biggest thing is, is design exploration. So now we can give parameters, we can give information, we can kind of front in your degree and what you learn and allow us to get that exploration of multiple hundreds and thousands of types of designs. Now that seems overwhelming. Oh, we're gonna have all these options. How am I gonna decide? Well, we've got some ways to, to figure out how to decide um, on what the best product is or best design for you. So if we look at the current kind of process, and that's this process in gray here, these kind of gray dots. In this current process, what we have is we have this iteration phase where we may get a handful of ideas, a handful of collaborations uh, that we're working through and we're trying to figure out, okay, I'm, I'm going to try this and then I'm going to try this, I'm going to change this. Once we get to that design to production phase, a lot of times we have this back and forth to the pro productivity. So we go, okay, I'm gonna design this and I send it off to go be made. Well, then we get a bunch of feedback back from the manufacturer that says, well, we really have a hard time doing this uh, type of, you know, maybe it's a, a 90 degree inside corner, which we don't wanna do, but we get that information from the manufacturer and the machinist says, we really can't do this or we really need to use an expensive process if this is what you're trying to get to. So we go back to the drawing board, we redo a design, we redo a product, and we go send it out again. In the, between that time, we might even actually test. We might actually make this part, test it, get some information, and bring it back into our original design set and go, oh, you know what, we need to tweak this, we need to change that. And then we eventually get to a final product, which is time to market. You know, that, that starts to really lengthen compared to where we end with generative design. So what's the difference between generative design and that process? Well, generative design allows you to look at uh, certain criteria. So we add in loads, we add in constraints, we add in materials. And one of the big things is, is we add in the validated manufacturing options. So we wanna find out, you know, what is this gonna look like if we try to machine it? If we try three axis, five axis, if we try additive, uh, so we want to look at these processes and we want to come up with a bunch of options. We also may want to look at, no, we want to make this out of aluminum. Maybe we want to make it out of steel, or maybe we want to make it out of ABS plastic. So I want iterations out of that as well. So what we do is we add all that information in, we give it some other criteria, which we'll show, and we shoot that up to the AI and to the cloud. And that creates then these outcomes that we can leverage and we can look at. So now we use our, our senses and our engineering knowledge to go, okay, based on the, the mass that I want, the factor of safety, the cost, potential cost of this, I've narrowed it down to these handful and then I can narrow it down even further to the final product. So now my productivity increases, right? So now we're allowed to do more, we're allowed to do these other things that we hardly ever have time for, really stretch to get to, we now have increased that productivity time and allowed us to do more as engineers and designers. So additionally, what we wanna do is we wanna improve that product performance. So we wanna make that either stronger or lighter uh, or some type of unique, unique situation there. Uh, of course, productivity, we wanna be able to do more as an engineer. We wanna be able to do other things uh, as we design this. Maybe it's the whole subsystem. We need more time to help with the subsystem, less time designing these individual parts. And then of course, cost is the other big one. So we can look at reducing the raw materials, which is big cost. We can find other manufacturing methods that allow us to reduce that cost as well. So as we look at these manufacturing methods, one of the great things is 
with Fusion 360 and the way we built the platform is we can add in new technologies all the time. You know, when Generative first came out, one of the things that we really did was kind of focus on just additive and milling. So we wanted to focus on those, those two, or additive subtractive, which is milling here. Now we've added die casting, we've added more two axis cutting. We've kind of got a little deeper into our, our milling uh, and, and our, our ability to do that. So we're able to look at all these manufacturing methods with the criteria provide and see which one fits best. And maybe we find out one is way out of our realm and an area we don't want to go down. Well, you've spent some a little time up front, but you really save a lot of time because you don't go down that path at the end of the day. You go down a different path. So we're going to give a couple examples here, and then we'll dive into the software. One of them at, that I really like is this MJK. So this is uh, on the front part of a mo motorcycle, uh, these mounts here. And as you look from left to right, we have uh, the human design, which is standard time, right? So we, 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 can, we need to account for time possibly and being able to save that, uh, which we don't have on here. But we can look at the costs, we can look at the weight savings, we can look at the factor of safeties that we can increase or decrease if we need to. And if we look at the second one, the two and a half axis generative, so two and a half axis is essentially, we're, we're gonna cut on a, on a plane, on an X, Y plane, if you will, and then we're going to move down in the Z direction down a little bit. And we're going to cut. And then we're going to move down and cut. We're going to move down and cut. So very simplified uh, process, but we can save 23% in weight there. We also see that our uh, safety factor, which is fine to go down at times, uh, also decreases. And our cost stays relatively the same. We can then look at three axis genitives. So now three axis is... Uh, where the, the part and the head and within the mill can move in different, different angles and give us some very unique geometry there. So we can have a little more robust geometry or kind of, uh, I like to say alien-like geometry there. And we can see there that we still save that, that factor safety, or I'm sorry, on our weight. We can see that the factor safety actually went up previously from the two and a half axis. But it, you know, it doesn't, it kind of has that alien look. Some people might not like that. You know, it's an aesthetic thing. Some people like the two and a half axis look a lot better than the three axis. Then we get into additive. So the last one is additive, which is 3D printing. So we could actually look at, you know, how do we print this in metal? You know, we can save 26% in weight. We can get our factor of safety down to maybe where we wanted it right at too. But look at our costs, our costs skyrocket. So with real quick, I can add all this information into the generative design, get these outcomes and really evaluate what I want this uh, to have. You know, what are, you know, am I looking at weight? Am I looking at sa uh, safety factors? Am I looking at cost uh, production of this part? So we can evaluate those things pretty quickly. So what is generative design and kind of how does it go? I'm going to show this video. I'm going to talk through it just because it does a great job of kind of going through all the steps and then we'll, uh, we'll show a couple more examples and then we'll jump in. So in this part in the motorcycle, so this is that part that we talked about. There's the original design that they had. So we could talk about lightweighting and what's called topology optimization. Where could we just remove the material? But we want to do much more than that. So we, we identify things that we want to keep. These features, these parts, are the, they can't change the shape of this. We also want to identify where we want to leave things out of. So where do we want material not to grow? And we want to add these constraints and we want to add these loads into here. And then from there, we start figuring out what do we want to do here? We want to minimize mass. So we want to make it lighter. We're going to look at different uh, manufacturing processes. We can actually get a price quote, say a thousand production volume. It'll give us a rough idea of what a cost would be based on this, um, on the uh, manufacturing method and also the materials that we've chose. And then we create that study and now we run that in the AI. Great thing is you can close down Fusion, you can go do whatever else you want. It's gonna go in the AI and develop these outcomes. And we get tons and tons and tons of outcomes. But now we can look at scatter charts. We can look at uh, an X, can, uh, a, a Y, I'm sorry, an X axis versus a, a Y axis in terms of our criteria that we're evaluating. We can start minimizing down to what type of material that we have. And we can explore those outcomes. We can look at that and kind of get a sense, oh, that looks nice. Uh, I like that. Maybe I want to modify that slightly or kind of change that particular part. I get an idea of what to change. 
And that allows me then to go into deeper and deeper and deeper evaluation of the parts and the processes that I wanna um, review and look at. So then we send that to our CAM side and that CAM side, then we add the tool pass and we go and make the part. We can send it to the additive as well. So we have the ability to send this out to the next, next step. So some uh, uh, success stories that we've had. Uh, here is Honda, uh, this uh, crankshaft that they have. Um, so allowed them to look at other considerable designs in the process. So not just locked into that one type of design. Uh, here we have the MJK, again, you know, light weighting. So one of the important things is logistics, right? Is maybe how can I make this lighter so we can ship more of them at a time and save money on those logistics? But also how do we make it cooled? Uh, Airbus, so now being able to explore these ideas and reduce weight, they're actually able to increase productivity at the end of the day and come up with, uh, with more and more iterations, but also that time that to select that particular iteration. Uh, Claudius Peters is one that I really like because if you look on the left side of that image, there's a genitive design that's come up. And these things are gigantic, they're heavy, they're, they're solid steel cast parts. But what's interesting is they didn't use that generative design model because if you're gonna, I mean, to print that or to die cast that, it's gonna be just way too much cost. What they did is they used it as an inspiration. They said, well, you know what? I, I see where it's going. I see what it's trying to do. I see where I can minimize some of my parts and pieces. So let me design as that, as or let me use that as a, um, an inspiration to what I wanna design. And here's a few others. And I think some of the things you're thinking about is, okay, these are like parts that actually go into a piece. Well, if you look at Goodyear, Goodyear looked at a hand tool. Now, how do we change a hand tool? Uh, we, we want to um, you know, make, it, make it a little more ergonomic or we want to make it a little lighter. We might want to make it easier for the, for the end user to use, but we also want to be able to uh, maybe take multiple parts that it has and bring it down to one part, which is what Gen GM did uh, where they created... 40% lighter and 20% stronger. But one of the things is they went from eight components down to one. All right, so let's get into Fusion here. So one of the things I wanna talk about first before we get into Fusion 360 or into generative design is Fusion has the ability to do everything you need to do from an engineering, from a design to make standpoint, all in one software. So we can actually do our design we can do generative design, rendering, animation, simulation, which is FEA analysis, and manufacturing and drawings um, as well. So we can do everything we need to do about that part to go from the design phase all the way to the manufacture phase. So one of the cool things that we have recently that's come up is kind of this, uh, what I like to say is kind of the gateway to generative design. And this is called our automated modeling. So I've got an example here of our automated modeling. And what this is, is an ability to automate some processes. And let's think about how we want to connect this. Because normally I would draw, you know, I, I would design and draw these, these three pieces here. And then I would start creating some connections here. You know, it's very basic and square. <clears throat> but in our automated process, automated modeling, is if I start with those, pieces, let me turn this body off, is now I can go in and select things that I wanna keep the material from growing in. So I wanna, you know, I want these pins. Uh, I don't want any material to grow in there because I need to put those pins in there at the end of the day. But I also don't want material to grow out here. So if I go back to my timeline here, actually I'm gonna go edit, edit feature is now I've selected my faces to connect. I know I wanna connect this, this, and this but I wanna have those holes in the middle so I can put those pins in there. I wanna select bodies to avoid. So I have these bodies that I want. I don't want any material to grow in here or here or any of these red areas. And I wanna create it as a new body so that way I can utilize it. So what it does is it comes up some quick uh, iterations. And within these iterations, you see that some of them look alike, like alternative one and alternative four look very similar. What the difference is, is those connectors. And it's kind of hard to see here, but when I have that connector selected and I hit OK, it's going to bring out then that design. 
And these planes are actually useful because it's actually making symmetry. In generative design, when it first started, things that were on one side weren't always the same on the other. So we created these symmetry planes that make life a little easier. But if I turn these options off right here, now I can see I get a little more kind of organic look of this, this part. But you know what? I didn't really like that. So we're going to go back and we're going to look at alternative four. So alternative four keeps that kind of rigid, more consistent look on the ends, these connectors. And now, again, it's more of an aesthetic thing. Did you like the previous one better because it had that organic feel? Or do you like this one better because it has that clean connector in feel to it? And this is using the AI. It's using some information, um, general information about this. It's not in depth, but it gives you a good idea of where to start or where, where to use, or you can use that particular piece as is. So it's kind of the gateway to genitive, very easy to, to do. So our next thing is, is let's keep it simple. Let's look at a shelf bracket. Everybody knows what a shelf bracket is. We wanna connect this piece, connects to the wall. Up on top is where a shelf is gonna be, where you're gonna put books or storage or something on top of that, right? Pretty easy. So this, this left side here is connects to the wall. This top side connects to the shelf itself. So the great thing about generative is I can have a, um, a part already made or I can start from scratch at the end of the day. Now, I like to reference a part because it gives me an idea of where I need to go and the things that I need to keep in consideration as I'm going through my generative design process. So once I'm good there and I, you know, I've got some of my base stuff, again, as rude and rudimentary as this thing is, is we can come up with some really interesting outcomes. So what I'm gonna do is go to generative design and within here, we're going to start with our original, original part here. And in Fusion, most operations, you go left to right, top to bottom, depending on where you're at into there. But one of the things we want to do is we want to identify some of these pieces for the generative design study. So we can go into edit model. And what edit model is that you're not editing the official model. Remember, your model is officially in design. So when you go to edit model, you're, you're basically creating shapes and things so you can tell what geometry to preserve and what geometry to keep as an obstacle and so as i've gone through this you know it's all your your standard um, um ability to cad in here so creating extrusion and sketches and modifying all that fun stuff but what i've done here is you can still see the bracket itself right here but i've added in some connectors here that I want to be able to put a screw. I need to be able to put a screw all the way through here from one side to the next. And so I got to tell it not to put material there. I've also got to tell it not to put material on the top, right? Where the shelf would go, but also where the wall is. So again, I don't want material to grow there. I want to be able to, uh, uh, to have that as a flat surface still. All right, so once I get all that modeling done, I hit finish model. And then my next thing, as I said, left to right is we need to preserve geometry and we need to have obstacle geometry. And so if I look at my preserve geometry, one of the things that I want to keep, the, the only four things is I just want to keep this center circle here that I have. I'm going to turn off the starting shape and I want to give it just some, some size. So when I put a washer in there, I put a screw head on there, it has something to secure to. But I want that geometry to stay the same no matter what happens to this. So now that I've gotten, that's where I said earlier, where you can start with a, a reference or you can have something of, um, you know, you can really just start from zero, from nothing and, and design from in, within this workspace to create your uh, preserve and obstacle geometry. The next thing is I want to add my obstacle geometry. So in this case, I want to add my obstacle geometry here on the back side where, where my shelf would be and where the wall would be. I don't want anything to grow there. I also don't want anything to grow in this middle here it's because I need to be able to screw into the wall and into the shelf to secure it properly. So now I have all that. I can add in symmetry planes. So if I wanted to keep this symmetrical about whatever axis or plane I wanted to, I can add that in there, which is great. Again, that's new. That was something that we sent out to the industry. The industry came back and said, you know what? We want to have symmetry because of aesthetics, because of being able to get this out to market or we just really like it looking symmetrical because of how we needed this to design in aerospace or whatever. 
So again, left to right, my next thing is, is structural constraints. So how do I want to constructurally constrain this? So what I have selected is I've actually selected the backside here. And let me turn off my obstacle geometry. So I've actually locked down this backside, these holes here as my constraint. So that's what's going to attach to the wall. So that's going to hold still right on that wall. I constrain that in all axis and I'm good. The next thing is structural loads. So think of structural loads because you're going to actually have load cases. So you're going to have multiple load cases here. And the way I like to think about load cases is if we're going to test a car and look at um, the, the viability of a car surviving a, uh, a crash, we might look at it in a couple different ways. We might actually do a head-on collision with a car and see how that operated. The next test is we might do a side T-bone uh, simulation or test on the car. Two different tests that we did independently. And then the third one is we might say, well, what happens if we get hit head-on and at the side at the same time? That'd be a third load case and a third test. So what uh, generative design is doing is taking all these kind of load cases and evaluating whether as they go through, as it goes through the process, that it, uh, it is selecting the right criteria and it's going to the point of, um, of, of being the best fit for the criteria you added in. And so now we, we've added that information in. And one of the things that we can do is we can also add in different types of structural loads. So we do have the ability to put moments in here. We have the ability to put forces and pressures. And I've put in three of them. And what I've kind of thought, thought about was if I've got a standard load of books on top of this, um, this part. I think that's load case one. Load case two is then, you know, maybe it's like kind of right above my head. And, and when I get up, I may hit it with my head. So now I've got a force that, that's going to push up on the kind of the end here. And then the last one is kind of like it gets hit on the side. Maybe I'm trying to put a book up and I kind of miss and I hit the side of it and I want to put a, a little uh, a little force from the side there. We can add multi, uh, all kinds of load cases to this, but that starts increasing your time of being able to generate those outcomes. So the next thing is our objectives. So we can do two. We can add, uh, look at minimize mass, make it lighter, or we can maximize stiffness, make it stronger. We can also look at safety factors. So now we can increase our safety factor uh, depending on kind of what industry you're in uh, or what you're, you're trying to accomplish uh, with that. There's some advanced areas as well, um, but we won't get into those today. The next thing is manufacturing. So now we can look at, you know, maybe I want to manufacture a thousand pieces of this and I want to look at what that cost is going to be roughly. I also want to look at uh, additive, and maybe I want to look at additive in a couple different ways. I want to look at printing this in the Z axis or the X axis. So now we can really evaluate what that cost would be based on how I print that in whatever orientation. The next area is milling. So now I can actually set up multiple configurations here. I can see maybe it's a three axis mill that only has two operations. So I put it in the vise. I machine the top, I take it out of the vise, I flip it 180 degrees, put it back in, and I mill the bottom side, and I'm pretty much finished. So we can look at that. We can also then evaluate maybe a three axis that is six sided. So now every time I take it out, I just turn it 90 degrees, whichever way I'm, I'm uh, cutting on that surface. And that allows me then to get even more complex geometry. And then the last thing is this five axis. So now I can look at it as multi-axis, five axis. How could I machine it? Uh, what would I get if I did it that way? We also have two axis cutting and die, cut, die casting as options. So the last thing before we kind of truck on here is our materials and we can add multiple materials, which is great. So now I can evaluate this based on a lot of different things. And we have a library here that has all the information about those materials. You can also add in customer materials. Um, but in this case, I, I evaluate it based on aluminum and ABS plastic. So essentially, we're going to machine it out of aluminum or and tentatively can 3D print it out of aluminum, um, but ABS plastic for our 3D printing side of things. So last thing is we kind of have some pre-check. So we can look at this and, and there's a check mark there. It means I've done everything right. If there's a yellow, it means something's just not quite right. It'll still run, but there's some issue. And then of course a red X means that, hey, you've not done something in the process, like maybe constrained it or add in uh, materials or something like that. So once we're ready, we can hit generate. And to education, 
uh, from both a, a teaching standpoint and from a, uh, a student standpoint is genital design is free for you. It uses cloud credits. You can think of one credit as $1. And so to run these studies, it takes an X amount of cloud credits to run the study. Uh, however, as education, you get this for free. You have basically an unlimited amount of, of credits to use. So once we're ready, we hit generate study and it's gonna go up to the cloud. Great thing is I can shut down Fusion. I can shut down my laptop, my computer, my Mac, whatever I'm using, I can shut it down. I'm good to go. I can go out and do the other things, go to class, go and, and expand my what I'm doing at work and let the AI do what it does best. All right, so a lot of work to get there, uh, it, uh, but if you use a, a reference, if you're identifying the parts and pieces that you need to keep uh, as preserves and identifying those areas you wanna keep material out of or from growing, and you have all that information up front, it's a pretty smooth process. And again, I like to say it front ends your engineering degree rather than back ends it. So you have to know uh, a little mechanical aptitude. You got to know a little bit about load cases and static and forces, um, but you're putting all on that all that on the front end to get your outcomes. And once you have that, is so we can go to Explorer. And once we go to Explorer, we start getting into this nitty gritty where I like to get to, where I can really start diving into details. I can look at mass. I can uh, move these these uh, scales across to come up with kind of a very specific thing. And and be able to come up with several outcomes. As you scroll through here, you can see that there's you know, and this one is not a ton, but I have some kind of random ones here that are a little different. I have this one that's a little different as well. But I have these uh, four recommended ones, and we'll open up this first one. And within here, once I open it up, I get even more detail, and I can move this around to kind of look to see now. See if I look at the the front end here where I told it to keep out material, it's keeping it out where I wanted to be able to apply, you know, put those screws in there. But I also did it so I I knew I could fit a certain screwdriver within here. So I put a I put a little more space in there so I could get that screwdriver. And then again, I have my preserves right here. I can also look at it from a stress view and say, you know what, I want to evaluate this. I just kind of want to see where the stresses are. What they look like, you know, blue is good, green is is uh is okay, and then you know, red is definitely uh not good. Uh, so we got you know, I think we look good. Let's look over here, price uh 15 to 41 dollars. Uh, if I look at this, this is unrestricted, so this is kind of it just generated a model, it didn't do it uh, based on a particular process. So, you know what, we don't like the unrestricted, so let's go to something different here. Uh, let's see what uh, this one came out to be. Oh, so this is three axis milling, six sided, made out of aluminum. I can see my range uh, for cost is about 12 to 43 dollars, median is about 22 dollars. Uh, factor safety was met. I can look at my mass here uh, in pound mass, 0.05. Uh, I can look at displacement. So I have a lot of information that's given to me. And you know what? It's kind of a unique design. But you may say, well, this is being machined, Jason. Why in the heck would you have a hole in here? I know some of you might be machining machinists on here or have that background like that. There's no, why would you do that? Well, the great thing is that this is not the only outcome in this. So we have these iterations down at the bottom. If you look, there's 47 iterations to get to this point. And if I go to iteration number one, all iterations are going to look like this. Guess what? It's pretty much a blob of material. Right, it's a very high factor of safety. If I look at this a little differently from this end, again, yeah, it kept out the material where I wanted to keep material out of. It did what I asked it to do. There's where I can get to the bottom. But that's you know that's pretty that, that ain't cool. I, I want coolness. I want that factor. But I really don't like 47. So let's jump to maybe 30 here and see what iteration number 30 came up with. So iteration number 30, again, it's evaluating all the things that you have put in there, all the criteria, and it's moving along the process. And again, this one's you know, kind of unique and different. It's got some uh, got some kind of missing pieces here. Again, it's saying, well, you know what? We can probably take some material out of here. We could do some unique things. Let's go to iteration number 40. Let's be the last one here. And you know what? Hey, this is starting to look like something I want to maybe use as a inspiration, or maybe I want to use this and I want to modify it. So I'm ready to export it. I'm ready to go. 
we can simply hit design from outcome. This is going to send it to the cloud. It's going to create the outcome. And once we have that ready and it comes back to us, we get an editable outcome here that we have. So this is a solid part. We can actually modify this as we need to. So I can click edit. And now if I had some issues where I had maybe some holes or maybe I kind of wanted to uh, modify some of these things, I have these modifiers in my form tools where I can actually just select modify and I can select a particular you know, node or point and I can move that and I can start adding and I have all these other modifiers where I can patch holes and smooth. So I, I have an ability to modify this past To what I've gave. So again, if I want to patch that hole, I could patch that hole. Or again, I can use this as inspiration and go, you know what? I see where they're going. I see where they're at. I kind of like this. Maybe, um, maybe I don't use this fully, but I use part of it. I can also edit this if I need to add more things. So now it's, you know, it's truly editable part. So I can add, add parts and pieces to this. If I need to maybe add a, another boss here, extrude that and add it and I'm good. So once I'm ready, I can send this off to the 3D printer. I can export it as an STL. I can use our own manufacturing processes. Come in here and send it to our mill, send it to the additive. You know, whatever I need to do next, I can do. And I happen to have a very similar one. This is kind of simplified, but I have that very similar thing printed here. This was going to be a, um, a bracket to hold a ring light um, for when um, COVID hit of having just some nice light on me as we met with instructors, um, but able to just print that out. I uh, gave it some criteria, just like we went through the process, printed that out actually with my form lab printer right behind me. So a couple additional things uh, with this is, is I can also do simulation. So if I do go and change some things about this, I can go down to simulation and it's gonna know it's gonna do a static stress study, but it also will tell me, hey, do you wanna bring in all the information you already gave it instead of starting from scratch? And if I hit yes, it's going to bring in that study and I can run this study uh, from a, a static load standpoint. Um, and I think I have some results here. Yeah, so I can run the results, um, I'm gonna solve that study. We'll see if it uh, it may take a little bit of time. There's a lot of information there. So to kind of depending on uh, how much information you give it, uh, depends on how long it, it takes. You can send it up to the AI or you can do a local um, solve as well. But we can, we can do that simulation, do that static based on the changes that I made to it after I created that generative outcome. So we'll let that go uh, there. We'll see, we'll come back to that here in a second. So I know a lot of questions typically are, you know, how do I, how do I get access? Uh, how do I learn? How do I have the ability to do this in, in my current role as, an, as a student, or even as time I, I get into the industry and bringing this, this to industry? So we have several different resources and I'll put each one of these resources in the chat here in a second. But one is learning fusion from just a standard standpoint of this is we have a mechanical design learning pathway. So it includes some courses, includes some projects, some instructor resources for those that are maybe teaching our TA or wanting to use this in another area. And then also helps you for if you want to go further and get your certification uh, in, in Fusion 360 mechanical design. So we have two courses in this particular pathway. Um, step-by-step -step videos, PDFs, all that information uh, to go and learn fusion from the very basics. And that's one of the things you should have is a, as, as a, a foundation of using fusion before you jump into to generative design. And also we have some unique uh, projects down here that are kind of tailored to unique design. So we know we want assembly. So that's a big thing of learning how to put assemblies together. Of course, molding uh, and coming up with these organic shapes. That's a big part of design as well. So we have that, that pathway, and I will put that uh, in the chat here. Uh, the next thing we have is we do have a, a course, set of courses. Uh, you can look at multiple types, but one of the great ones is Introduction to Generative Design for Manufacturing. 
So this goes through again, a course that goes through uh, everything you need to know and how to go through the process of getting to the point of sending this out to be made uh, from a generative design standpoint. So it dives way deeper into what I uh, just discussed. And then the last thing is, is as, as we're talking about this simulation is being able to understand what static stress analysis is and, and what these pathways are and how to leverage this. So we have two new things um, that go through these courses that teach you how to do static analysis. Um, and you can also get certified in that as well. So we have certifications in multiple areas of fusion. So it still says 30% done. Uh, I'll jump to this one here real quick. Uh, yeah, we'll actually go to design. This is the base model. So I can actually just do a simple simulation. Or maybe I found like, you know what? What if I did some, some generative design and see what I can come up with here? Again, I add in my load cases uh, to this. I know that blue is good. Red is bad. You know, how could I fix this? Well, I, shoot, I could just add some support here. I could add something to this to help maybe stiffen that. So we can use static stress analysis to give us an idea of what we can take away, where we might need to add stuff. But if we go through Jennifer design, we're gonna give all these multiple outcomes instead of doing it piece by piece here. Um, let's see here. So it's still solving, it looks like, yep. So we will bypass that. If that jumps on before, um, before we leave, I'll pull it back up. But here's the static stress analysis, one that I forgot to add. So I wanna make sure that I had plenty of time uh, for questions, comments, um, anything you have there. So I will conclude uh, the official presentation, but open it up for Q&A. Thank you so much, Jason. And thank you to our audience members for joining us today. Um, I invite everyone to uh, reflect on, you know, kind of what you heard today and go ahead and submit your question uh, via the chat function uh, in Zoom. And we'll, we'll read through those and allow the presenter, Jason, here to, to respond. And then, you know, we can open it up for follow-up questions if you want to talk directly to the presenter. Um, but Jason, I, I was curious, um, I had a few questions just to kick things off here. Uh, it's wonderful that this software is available to students and, you know, to the uh, educational world. Um, I was wondering if you can talk just a little bit more. So if there's if there are students or professors listening today who are interested in accessing the software, you showed some of the training and things that are available, but how would they actually go about accessing the software or, you know, signing up for the training and, and getting going here? Absolutely. Um, and I apologize, I had it open, but I closed it just a second ago. There we go. Um, so we have an education community. So if you go to autodesk.com backslash education, uh, you can start the process of becoming a, a verified um, user. And that means uh, either you're a student or an educator uh, at a degree granting institution. And within this, uh, there's a lot of information here. Um, and we, we have a ways information for the educators and mission uh, information for the administrators, but students simply click students. I'll tell you what, I'll put a copy of this in the chat as well. And uh, you go through the process of creating an account. And that's the first thing that you have to do is create an account and go through our process of becoming verified. And with that is just showing that you're a, a student uh, helps us. Uh, you know, as we work on making sure we can continue to provide this for free to all of education, we want to make sure it's being used by the educational uh, market. And then you go through the process and it's pretty clear and step by step and you download those products, including Fusion 360, and you have it ready to go. I will note that a couple unique things. Uh, one is, of course, Fusion works on PC, uh, laptops, computers. You don't need a fancy high-end CAD computer to run Fusion 360, which is outstanding. The next thing is it runs on Mac, uh, so we can use Fusion on, on the Mac platforms. And then we also have a web browser version. Now that's intended more for those that don't have you know, healthy computers or maybe have Chromebooks or something that really limits them from getting the full Fusion software, um, but allows you to, to, to utilize uh, that option. So we want to make it accessible uh, to everyone um, and, and utilize Fusion uh, on any platform. Terrific. Thank you. Um, 
Once again, I want to you know remind our audience members the chat is open and available for you to submit your questions. Um, I'm also just you know I, first of all I appreciate this real this inside look at the design process. It was really fascinating to watch as you work through the software. I felt like I was building something while I'm in this lecture <laughs> with you today. Um, I guess one of one of the questions I have is you know, where, where do you see this going in the future? What are, what are some of the future challenges and opportunities when it comes to generative design um, and, and that process and, and where, you know, what industries it can be used for? It obviously seems like it has a lot of applicability to, to almost any industry, but, but what do you see as some of the upcoming challenges and, and use of the software? Yeah, I believe, uh, you know, one of the things is, is one of the challenges is, this can go in so many different directions. So how do we stay focused at, at Autodesk and, and concentrate on, you know, what is needed now? Uh, what can we solve tomorrow versus what are we trying to solve 30 years from now? Um, or where could this go? So, so I think that's a challenge of, of staying focused on what, you know, let's solve the thing we need to solve. Uh, let's also make sure it's right, make sure it's useful uh, for the industry uh, and for education as well. I think uh, the the other challenges are that you know this is a new technology, so getting getting that um, you know industry is is always slow to adopt new technology is getting an understanding of where this can be used in in industry in education. I think that's one of the key things and one of the great things about education is students are not afraid to use this tool in unique and different ways. So getting it in the hands of a student that goes, you know what, what if we did this instead? I know it's not the intended use, but let's try it out. Allows us to see new use cases and new ways of leveraging uh, a technology where we didn't have the, that intended um, idea as, as we created that this product. I think the other thing where we're going is, is a lot of things being, uh, let me go back to uh, the original design here, is this automation, you know, automated modeling. And I think, uh, you know, there's, there's some things of people saying where you're kind of taking the engineering or the designing out of it or possibly, you know, replacing jobs with this AI. It's not that at all. It's, it's using more efficient practices to be more efficient at your job and be better at the end of the day and create a better product, a more sustainable product and on and on and on. Uh, we want to be better at that. So how do we help the engineering designer to do that now? Will this be fully adopted and everybody be using this? No, but I think there's certain use cases that, hey, this is a great idea. Let me get some information going from an automated standpoint. I think what would be great and cool is if what if we did some of the automation a little bit in the manufacturing side? What if I was able to take this into manufacturing and kind of say, hey, just do some basic operations, something real simple, just to kind of get me started in a right pathway? You know, how could I automate that process? So I think, you know, it's, it's thinking of those ideas of being able to just accelerate a little bit more to become more efficient in our practice and what we do to create a better product at the end of the day. Thank you so much. And it looks like some audience members are chiming in here. We have one question from Liz Lee, and then we'll go to GTMI's Executive Director, Tom Kerfus, who has raised Perfect. his hand. Uh, Liz, I see you asked a question. How does Autodesk's generative design product offering compare with other similar offerings in the market? Uh, if you want to go ahead and take that, Jason. Absolutely. So, so one of the big things is the advantage of the manufacturing methods up front and a lot of the information that you're, you're, you're putting in. Now, one of the things that, that has changed and what I, I kind of get a, a little bit of a, a chuckle sometimes is, you know, we say generative. So, so we're talking about multiple outcomes. We, we want a lot of different ways of thinking about the criteria we put in and how that's determining design. Uh, some of the other kind of competitors, you know, it's, it's one design. And that's the only outcome that you get based on the criteria they put in. It's also that we have this workflow and this ability to go through the process uh, very simplified and allow, you know, a, a kind of a novice user to be able to go through this process and come up with outcomes. We also allow for multiple materials. And again, the, the manufacturing processes and the, and the criteria of being able to maximize stiffness or minimize mass is we have all of that built in to create these studies. And then the last thing I will say is this ability to 
look at our results in a very unique and different way of you know having scatter plots and having different um, different ways of of evaluating our outcomes. Terrific. And um, Liz, does that answer your question? If you have a follow up, you can unmute yourself and. Okay. Um, and Tom Kerfus, are you able to unmute yourself? Yes, much to the chagrin of some of my colleagues. But um, so, Jason, really uh, nice presentation. You know, one of the things I've, I'm thinking about in, in you know, you, you mentioned about, well, yeah, not, not replacing people and so forth. To me, it is almost like automation. People always get very nervous about physical automation. This is more intellectual or mental right. you know, type of, of, of automation. I, I look at it as more as augmenting. In fact, frankly speaking, I'm much happier working with AI. Uh, you know, it, it's a whole lot safer, in my opinion, than, than, than sort of strapping into an exoskeleton and giving it a whirl. I think we've all, all seen, I think it was, uh, I think it might've been uh, Iron Man one or two, right on that one over there. But anyways, um, you know, but then being said, I guess the question that I would have to you is to me, that augmentation, it really is the working of the human with the machine. You know, and on one hand, I think I hear what you're saying. You don't want to just throw the problem to the machine and let it solve it because it gives, it'll give you a solution, but probably not practical. On the other hand, you also want to let the machine explore a lot of different areas that the human might just, you know, not even be looking at. So how do you, how do you work, get the human and the machine working together so that you don't go down some narrow rabbit hole that the human says, oh yeah, here's, you know, the answer must be over here, but also you don't let the machine go off on some crazy, uh, you know, wild goose chase. And that's a great question, Tom. And I, and I think that's, that's kind of the, you know, we're balancing on that fence. Um, often in this design is how much do we let it take off on its own and, and go do its own thing? Because, you know, we can definitely go down that, that rabbit hole in that design process, but at the same time is, you know, how much information is too much information and you kind of circle back to where you started again, because you put in so many uh, uh, re restraints and constrictions on the process, on the ability for it to design. And I believe, uh, you know, as Autodesk does, uh, typically does a great job of communicating with the industry and, and determining, you know, what are the things that are important? And there's a reason why, you know, we have these certain things that have come on since generative designs come up, you know, being able to add more than just two or three materials, being able to add now, I think it's nine materials there. Um, looking at, um, you know, I think at one point, you know, not even seeing von Mises stress was on here. Now, you know, the industry kind of came back and said, you know what, that's an important factor that we need to evaluate on. We should probably have that in there. So I think it's a constant back and forth with what industry is doing. Also, you know, being careful not to be too forward thinking, uh, too far out there, too quick, um, and, but meeting, everybody kind of meeting at the same place at the same time uh, to have just enough information, not too many constraints, but also not allowing it to just Kind of go off on its own either yeah. so that's a, that's a great question i i'd really love to have uh one of our a couple of our executives uh as you know a few of them uh listen to their their thoughts and talk on that and how they're managing um that as we move on into these because these multiple roles generative is going to grow and it's going to become in, in multiple areas so how do we control that right and, and i think just you know as a follow-on in terms of some of the, the efforts or work that we're doing together it's it's yeah you know, we don't quite know how to use this and sort of really do it. I think if people say, hey, I'm going to do generative design, you can get something that you can print and people will say, oh, we can print anything. But I think we all know, and I'm talking to people who are in the know here. Uh, I, you know, I see Austin over there, for example. Yeah, uh, you can't print just anything. There's no just print button, right? So there are some constraints. So how do you, how do you build those in and, and, and work with it and so forth? I mean, it's, 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 it's very cool. And I think this is where it's going to go. And we're looking at it even in 2110, so sophomore level. But how do we teach Doom? How do we get them to think of it? I, I, that's more of a rhetorical question. That This is like the big question. How do we get them to think along these lines? But it's very cool. Thank you, Jason. Oh, thank you. Thank you. And uh, Jason, looks like we have a couple of other questions that have come in. I'm going to allow the, the audience members themselves to ask if they're able to unmute. Otherwise, I'll read them off. So Andrew is first. I see you posed a question about AI going about optimization. If, if you're unable to unmute, would you like to ask your question directly? Yeah. Um, so essentially, I'm just kind of wondering if you can give a little insight into 
the actual process the AI is going through because it seems it's a lot more making randomized changes to design and then reevaluating, you know, did that improve the mass while not compromising the structure or is it following some kind of set, I want to say caked in design processes. Um, the big thing is just like, essentially, is it resolving that you want to have triangles instead of squares every single time you run this or do you have it, is it intelligently making these changes or is it more of a, um, just a mass randomization and then reevaluation? Yeah, so that's a great question, and I'm um, not fake my way through it, uh, but I'm gonna answer what 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 I know because it is very much a, a proprietary um, algorithm that we've gone through, and it's been you know it's vetted. There is a white paper. I'll I'll, I'll try to find it before we leave, uh, but we have a white paper on the process itself uh, from a couple of years ago that talks about how it goes through there. Uh, but it is very much uh, 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 an organic method, and as I said, you know, as it goes through you know, iteration number one, you know, they, it's very much going through those, those, um, the, um, oh, what do they call them? The, uh, sorry, load cases. So it's going through the load cases, it's going through all that criteria that you pull in. And, you know, even if you run a study a second time, you may not get the same results every time for that same exact scenario um, because so something may have changed or, or tweaked slightly on there. Um, but it does go through an algorithm. I, I, I don't know to your question kind of, you know, what those steps really are and, and which one is a priority and then which one secondary and tertiary and, and so on and so forth. Um, but it is using all that information to create that. And that's what, you know, topology optimization, why this is different is topology optimization just really kind of shows you where material can be taken away. It doesn't necessarily show you where you should add material because you took it away here where you should add material here to, uh, to accommodate uh, for that, because you can actually get a topology optimization outcome. Uh, we actually have the ability to do that in our uh, simulation. You can actually do a, a, a simulation here and do a shape optimization. But you, know, you can essentially have a bracket and it's telling you like, oh, just take out this corner. Well, now you have two pieces, right? You got to do some evaluation of how you're going to take out that that material and then add that back in. Um, so I'm not necessarily answering your question fully and maybe in a vague sense, but there is a process that it is going through. Yeah, that's great, thanks. That's, that's, yeah, that's, uh, that's a little bit out of my pay grade. <laughs> yeah, thank you. Um, it looks like we have about three minutes left before the end of our hour. So I see uh, one additional question came in from Austin. Um, Austin, are you able to unmute yourself? Would you like to ask your question directly or otherwise I can read it for you? Okay, sorry, it looks like he does not have a mic available at this time, but I'll, I'll pose the question uh, for his benefit and everyone's. So the question is, what is Autodesk looking at in terms of incorporating errors from previous manufacturing steps into subsequent manufacturing steps? For example, if an additive process induces thermal distortion or more porosity than planned, how do these errors get used to improve the subsequent uh, machining operation? Yeah, great question. I think this goes back to the kind of the conversation we were having with Tom is, you know, what's the next iteration of this? And, and, and I believe it's, you know, being able to bring in, you know, more data, more information into the process itself <clears throat> so that it, it's, it's continually learning best practices and going through that which it kind of gets back to your point andrew of you know being able to the the how is the data coming back and being optimized within that process to keep that process optimized as much as possible but i will say right now for things like what you're talking about with the thermal distortion is that is information to bring back once you've got it in the manufacturer. So, you know, if we're gonna manufacture this and we put on, you know, use a wrong tool path or do something wrong and we post that code, right now that's human error based on what I put in. So the information that I put in is the information that's coming out. So we wanna do things like simulation and ability to actually evaluate this um, before we send it out. But right now it's, it's very much a manual process from once you've got that part made because you still have to machine it. So you still have to put on the G code. You still have to 3D print it. So it means you still have to send it out as a, 
an STL file to the proprietary software, the 3D printer. Uh, if you're going to die cast it, you know, that, that cast, that mold still has to be made. And so you still have those processes that are very manual where you're putting that data into there. But I think to your point is when we have information that, that says, hey, this I found a better process, we have better information, how do we bring that back? And that starts getting into the machine learning, that starts getting that feedback to um, that I know, you know, there's some research being done of how to bring back, you know, chatter information and all that stuff from, from the machine, bring it back and use that data, you know, industry 4.0 uh, uh, and all that. So great question, where we're going, I don't have a sense of, of where that is, but you know, as this thing grows, that's a need that we need to have in there. Thank you so much, Jason, um, for a really engaging presentation. I think this was a great way to kick off a, a Monday. And um, I want to thank our audience members for joining us today and and for you know submitting your questions. We are really at the top of the hour, so I think we'll close out soon, but I would like to encourage everyone to join us next Monday, September 26th at noon again, to hear from Keo Cody, who will be our guest from Textron Ground Support uh, Equipment, and he will present uh, electrification and customization. So really looking forward to, to that lecture. And also, if you'd like to rewatch any portions of today's lecture or you know invite some of your uh, friends or colleagues who were unable to attend today, we will post a recording of today's lecture on the Georgia Tech Manufacturing Institute website, GTMI website under past, uh, past events. So feel free to, to log in there and that should be available in the next uh, day or so. Thank you again, Jason. It was a pleasure. Um, and thank you to our audience members. Thank you. Okay. Bye-bye.